Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning to receive from the Lord's Word and Sacrament. If you have your bulletin insert, I'd like to ask you to please turn to that for some announcements here this morning. As far as this upcoming week here, we want to make a brief mention on Monday at 10 o'clock. We have the funeral service for Ruth Lane. And so our beloved Ruth uh, passed away this last week. Uh, is with Jesus now in paradise, and yet we at the same time mourn her loss, and we'll be having a funeral service for her on Monday. And so keep that in mind. Uh, that'll be tomorrow at 10. Uh, later this week, we can see on Wednesday, we have the Minot LYF bonfire. The youth are getting together with uh, St. Mark's and Our Saviors over at Our Saviors Lutheran Church for a bonfire. I'm hoping if there's not a fire band, we'll see. It might be a bonfire list night, uh, but nonetheless, we'll have some activities and so forth over there on Wednesday night. Uh, speaking of the youth, on Friday and Saturday, the youth and anybody else who's able to uh, attend, heading up to Shepherd's Hill at the crossroads, the uh, work up there at the camp. There was some work that was done this, uh, this summer, but there's some things to tie up uh, before we enter into the uh, winter season, so that'll be this Friday and Saturday. If you have any questions, talk to Diane or Amanda, I would assume. Um, the, and about details about that as well. On the very back of your bulletin, there's information too. Pastor Roth is out of the uh, out of town here, August 16th through the 23rd. Keep that in mind. He's hoping, I believe, to get up to Canada to do a little fishing. So hopefully he comes back after the 23rd. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's some information there too about confirmation parents and youth coming up as well as we transition into the fall schedule. Are there any other announcements that I may have missed that need to be mentioned at this time? Well, this morning, we are the 11th Sunday after Trinity, and oh, wow, we, we come into encounter with two wonderful texts that we're going to hear today, one about Cain and Abel from Genesis 4, as well as in the New Testament about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And more specifically, we're going to consider how both of these function. What is that spirit, that, 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 the way things work for Cain and that Pharisee versus what does it mean functioning in that realm as a tax collector and the church of Abel? We'll hear more about that in the sermon here this morning. But before we do so, our opening hymn, hymn of invocation is hymn number 761.
ask the congregation to please stand as we turn to the top of 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by the virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro it. Printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. God is in his holy habitation. He settles the solitary in a home. The God of Israel. power and strength to his people. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. But the righteousness shall be glad, they shall exalt before they shall be jubilant with joy. O oh God, when you went out before your people, in your goodness, O oh God, you provided for the needy. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our
Almighty and everlasting God, always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things that we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistles from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. According to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men, were, two men went up into the temple to pray, 
one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. With one heart and one voice, we confess our faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed on 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being a one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end and I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 559.
of Jesus. Amen. I had a next door neighbor once, let's call her Eleanor. Eleanor was a lifelong churchgoer in her 80s. She taught Sunday school. She was also a school teacher. And she was also very, not just very, but very, very stern. Besides being stern, she was also very righteous. And she knew that she was indeed righteous. She crossed her T's. She dotted her I's. She was a model citizen who never broke the law. She paid her taxes on time and contributed to society. But amid Eleanor's righteousness was something very problematic. You see, most everyone who knew Eleanor was afraid of her. You heard that correctly. She was very terrifying. They were afraid of her. Now, she wasn't physically strong by any means. She was not a very domineering disposition, only standing at about five foot two, five foot three, maybe with high heels. So what made her so intimidating was not her physical presence, but rather it was her sharp tongue and her shaming eyes. You see, she saw herself above others around her. She even kept score when others around her would fail to meet up to her expectations. So, for example, you would not even dare mess up around or in front of Eleanor, for she would tell you what she thought and remember your fault forever. All while at the same time shaking her head in disgust and shame. She had a way of categorizing sin, your sin, everybody's sin around her. It was in her memory. She did this so she could easily access that memory of that sin and bring it forward in her mind and bring it forward, forward in front of others around her, those who needed a kick in the rear. Now, speaking of getting a kick in the rear, one night, I kid you not, there was a big storm and a very large tree fell on, fell on Eleanor's garage. One of the other neighbors in that area he was actually a retired truck driver, a drunk truck driver, suffering from severe diabetes. He said to me over the fence, Hey, Reverend, get over here. Reverend, did you see what happened to Eleanor's garage? To which I indicated that I did. He then went on to say, and I kid you not, You know, I've been, I've been feeling really sorry. I've been feeling really sorry this morning, Reverend, for God. I've been feeling sorry for God this morning. For I'm sure that Eleanor gave him a horrific tongue lashing and a kick in the rear. Ouch. Now, with this in mind, I'm certainly not trying to be overly cruel to Eleanor. And I'm not trying to air some past pent up emotions, some past pent up emotions to you. But rather, every time that I, every time that I read our reading from the Gospel of Luke, this story of the tax collector and that Pharisee, I wonder if Eleanor is with Jesus in glory. I sure hope so. I do. But I don't know for sure. You see, I would put the odds in favor of that drunk, diabetic truck driver being in glory before Eleanor. That is, if I was a betting man, and I'm certainly not. You see, Eleanor, she embodied the same disposition, the same theology, the same spirit, if you will, as that Pharisee did in our reading from the Gospel of Luke. And here is the kicker. The Pharisee, for all that he did and achieved, he left that temple, mark this, not, yes, not being justified, not being right with God. Consider a moment the actions of that Pharisee. He declared himself to be good. He looked at his own works. He put himself in the spotlight for everyone to see. He kept score of what he did. He displayed all of his good qualities so that everyone could see it. He knew that he was higher up on the scale of righteousness compared to all those extortioners and those thieves and everybody else beneath him. Frankly stated, he was an arrogant you-know-what. <laughs> he certainly was. But at that temple that day was also a tax collector. And unlike the Pharisee and Eleanor... The tax collector declared himself to be a sinner. He looked not to himself, but to God's mercy. His head was down. He was hanging low as he stood far off in the shadows of unimportance. He declared defeat. 
And he beat his chest. He beat his chest in repentance. I am the sinner. I am a sinner, Lord. Now, I need to caution you and me right now as you think about this story of the tax collector and the Pharisee. I need to caution you as you consider that story of Eleanor as well. You see, the issue, the issue that Jesus is addressing is not that the Pharisee and, the El- and Eleanor, not that the Pharisee and Eleanor were wrong for fasting or giving offerings or teaching Sunday school or even being stern. Jesus is not showing us that being a religious Sunday school teacher is a bad thing and being a drunk, retired truck driver is good. No, that's not the point. He's not stating that good works are somehow bad. But instead, Jesus is showing you and me. Please listen. Let's listen carefully. What Jesus is showing you and me is this, that godless pathetic, Pathetic and wretched attitude. That godless, pathetic, and wretched attitude of becoming complacently pleased with ourselves is the problem. He exposes the problem of when you and I pridefully delude ourselves, self-delude ourselves into thinking that our good works, that our attitudes, our own puffed-up abilities somehow obtain favor with God. But we may say to ourselves, isn't God pleased with the good works that we do? Yes, He is. God loves it when we do good works for our neighbor. But when we do good works for another person, for our neighbor, thinking that we are somehow getting our foot in the door with God, well, we just insult God's grace. Oh, do we insult it. Believing that if we do something good, then God will somehow owe us for what we did is not only extremely manipulative, but it tramples upon the blood of Christ. Making the Christian faith about what we do and how we're doing it better than everybody else around us does not add to Christ's work on the cross, but it spits upon Christ's work. And besides, it's supremely arrogant. Think about the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul does something quite remarkable. This is just absolutely remarkable. It is as if, it is as if he decides to play a game with the Pharisees and the Eleanors of this world. He's actually taking them on. Listen to a paraphrase what Paul says. Paul says this. You know my pedigree. A legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of purity of my religion, even the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous, ah, meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. Now, do you hear it? Hear what Paul's doing? He's one-upping them. He's keeping score of what he has done, and he looks to the Eleanors and the Pharisees and what they have done, and he's saying this, I'm outscoring you, I'm better than you, I'm doing it better than you. But then hear what Paul says next. Paul then goes on to say this. Ah, the very credentials, these very credentials, these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing them up and throwing them out with the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. It's all these things I once thought were that were so important are gone in my life, gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my, knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. It is dog dung. It is scubala. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting in Jesus and His righteousness, God's righteousness. Dear friends, Now it makes sense, does it not? The tax collector was not declared righteous because he was a tax collector. Instead, he was declared righteous because he knew that he was not righteous and that he needed a righteousness from another. Consider what that tax collector said and what he did. What the Pharisee and Eleanor's do not understand is that when they look 
at the tax collector. They see a sinner at the bottom. They see a sinner in the shadows of unimportance. They see a sinner beating his chest and defeat. They see a loser. But that is not what Christ sees and declares. Dear baptized saints, Christ does not come. He does not come for arrogant, self-righteous, puffed up, spiritually driven superstars. God opposes those who are so caught up in their pride, looking downward and contempt on others, thinking that they don't need God's grace. God opposes the proud. But when you and I declare ourselves as sinners, yeah, when we declare ourselves as sinners, when we, when we realize our sin, we're brought to repentance, when we look outside of our life for mercy, when we are defeated in the shadows of unimportance, The Lord, though, he does not somehow look over you and me. You are not forgotten. And he's certainly not unnoticed. You see, that day at the temple, the tax collector, he went home, made right with God. Not the Pharisee. And the reason being is this. If you walk around with your nose held high before God, you will end up flat flat on your face in hell itself. But when you are poor in spirit, when you are meek, mournful of your sins... Hungry for righteousness, the Lord does not disappoint. He has great joy. He does. He has great joy in giving you good gifts. In his word and sacraments, he gives you rich grace. He gives you a comforted conscience. He gives you joyful forgiveness. And he gives you hearty assurance, a sheer gift. And so, really, what this all boils down to is this. You and I need not care what the Eleanor's (laughs) <laughs> what the Eleanors of this world think, say, or do. Why would we care? Why would we care when we have Christ and Christ has us? In fact, in Christ, we are free from the constant worry of trying to acquire righteousness through our own strength, our own power, our own endeavors. We throw it in the trash. We confess Christ and we receive Christ. This means that we get to do good works neither to impress the Eleanors of this world nor to build up our own spiritual resumes But simply, my friends, because they're good. To do good works because they're good. They're good for our neighbor. This is the freedom of being a Christian, dear baptized saints. In Christ, we are perfectly free, Lord of all, subject subject to no one. And at the same time, we are dutiful servants of all, subject to everyone in Christian love. You're made right with Christ, period. It's Christ, period. It's a sheer gift for you. Righteous, sanctified in Christ and Him alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. As congregation, please stand for the offertory. may be seated for the offering as a way to remind the offering plate is at the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be mailed into the church office or conducted through the church website online.
Ask the congregation to please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Be merciful to us, Heavenly Father, for daily we are tempted by Satan and daily we sin and transgress your will. For the sake of Christ Jesus and his bitter suffering and death upon the cross, forgive us, Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to our neighbors, especially those who have sinned against us and done us harm. Give us patience and strength that we would deal with them gently and humbly, readily forgiving as we have been forgiven. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to all in need, especially children who lack food, clothing, and shelter, and all orphans who are in need of parents to care for them. Heavenly Father, provide earthly fathers and mothers and friends and neighbors to care for them. Give us generosity to serve as agents of your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to our land, that those with any authority would exercise it with wisdom and righteousness, and that we would have peaceful days. Be merciful to the nations of the world, that wars would cease and harmony be restored. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to the sick and the sorrowing. We pray especially this morning for Brian and Carl, Charlotte, Connie, David, Dean, David, George, Gloria, James, Jeff, Joellen, Marilyn, Darlene, Philip, Randy, Rita, Robert, Robert, Ruth, and Suzanne. We also pray for the family and friends of Ruth Lane as they mourn her loss. We pray that as all of these individuals are burdened by the difficulties and hardships of life in this fallen world, that they would receive not only temporal relief, but know the forgiveness of their sins and have the constant hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we continue to the service of the sacrament on page 194, we continue repentance and faith to receive the gifts the Lord has for us in his body and blood given and shed for us. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Center, one of our sister congregations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel at the rail, and cross your arms to receive a blessing this day. And if you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift of the altar, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. We continue on 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, and saying... Trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is a new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, this do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Mr. Congregation, to please stand for the Nunc Dimittis on page 199. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the solitary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Maybe see if they're departing him, hymn number 686.
consider both that Pharisee and that tax collector, we rejoice in his beating of his chest, confessing his sins. God declares, not I condemn you, but you are righteous, I forgive you. Dear baptized saints, you are forgiven in Christ. You are righteous because of Christ. Cling to Christ. Christ clings to you. Amen.